right. Anybody have a bad Thanksgiving? All right. I'm glad to hear that. All right. Do you know what today is? Sunday. First day of the week. Lord's Day. Today is the first day of Advent. 28 days that we celebrate the coming of the King who is going to redeem Israel. Scripture says... Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. We're going to sing about that. 123, O come, O come, Emmanuel. We're going to sing one verse, one verse, because we're closing with this same hymn at the end of this morning's service. So one verse, let's rise, please. Todd, good to see you here. Welcome. to pray for the Merlows. We pray for Denny. Is he, is he still in the hospital? Do we know? He's home? Good. Recovering? We'll pray for his recovery and others who are down with illnesses of all, all different sorts and uh, for those who will be traveling. I'm sure the Brum family, uh, they have kids who will be on the road and uh, some will perhaps maybe here visiting today. I don't know. But uh, let's go to the throne of grace. Father, thank you for your love, your love for us. You sent your son for us that we might have life, life eternal. All we have to do is accept it and grasp a hold of it and commit to you the fact that we are sinners saved by grace and grace alone. We're thankful, Father, that we can come to you with our cares and our praises. We think of Merlaus. We pray that you would raise Danny up today and uh, give him strength and help him to recover from this uh, illness and others who are dealing with illnesses. We just pray for uh, restoration and health and strength for them. Be with those who will be traveling today. This will be probably one of the busiest traveling days of the Thanksgiving season. We just pray that you would be with those on the roads and keep them safe and bring uh, our church people here safely this morning. Thank you for your love for us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, everyone can be seated, but the two, three, fours, and the five. through seventh grade, fourth, whatever you are. You believe that? I need to do that every day. I think many of us have to, are in the same canoe. So, uh, the Teens. Hebrews 10, 24, and 25. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Hebrews 10, 24, and 25. Thank you.
Thank you. All right, adults. Remain standing and the rest of you can rise. You go out on the course of the king is coming, 238. Israel was looking for their king. We're looking for our king, and he's coming, hopefully soon. Amen? Amen. All right. The king is coming, 238 if you need it, or it'll be on the screen. Thank you, Roger. I'll move up a little bit here. Did you all have a wonderful Thanksgiving? Yes. What a time. And Wednesday night, communion, remembering what we have in Christ. I appreciate the discussion in the background of uh, Ephesians, what Ephesians, the information of Larry uh, and Pastor Norton and many others. Ephesus was the second largest city in the Roman Empire. It was a center of religion, little r. And we talked about this temple to the goddess Diana, Demetrius. Uh, the legend has it that the goddess fell from heaven and landed there, and they decided they were going to build a temple there. Somebody, I heard somebody laugh, but who else fell from it? You know, and yeah, it's Satan worship is what this whole thing is, and you'll see that. Um, <clears throat> this temple was one of the seven wonders of the world. Um, along with the pyramids, uh, Great Wall of China, uh, Bab the uh, Babylonian gardens. This temple was comprised of 130 columns, 60 foot tall, I don't know what the ceiling is, covered in gold. So you'd come in the harbor and you'd look up and this thing is shining in the sunlight. And the Roman world would contribute to this. They would send a column for when they went to build this because this was a Roman god. They also, within the temple complex, built a, put a central bank. So they realized the, the criminals would not rob from the bank because this goddess and god would chase them to any of the ends of the Roman Empire and kill them for that. This temple at sundown would send out male and female prostitutes into the town. So I say, satanic. Satanic worship. Uh, it's to hear that the Apostle Paul goes and they build a church. Um, I, uh, in the course of going through Ephesians, 
is following a gentleman named uh, John Barnett. He was a pastor over Kalamazoo for a while, and out in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and out in Rhode Island. He's on audiosermons.com. And he takes a lot of uh, tours, people over to the Jerusalem and all over the Middle East there. And one of the one of them he went to Ephesus. And uh, I'm listening to this, and he's telling about they met on the shore, and that's where in Acts 20, the Ephesians uh, elders met when he departed. I need to read that. that that's touching. The, the tour guide said, come on, come on, gather around here. I want to show you something. Just to give you an idea of what Ephesus was about, and the whole Roman world. And he pointed to a picture on the carved into the walkway there. It was pornographic. He said, now some of these are homosexual and some are heterosexual. If you watch it, you'll see markers going down. It'll turn off to a, a doorway to a foundation. And going through these lessons, I, was, I kept hearing these verses about walking in Ephesians. So I pulled my concordance up, and we're going to go to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2. And in the concordance, there was eight times that he spoke of walking, the word walking in Ephesians. Could there be a correlation? No. So I'm going to read these verses. Now, in one of these, I said eight times, one of them is used in the Greek twice, but you will not, when I read it in the ESV, it won't come up that way, and I'll, I'll mention that. Um, verse, chapter 2, verse 2, in which once you walked, following the course, following the prince and the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the sons of disobedience. Chapter 2, verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared for beforehand that you should walk in him. Them. Chapter 4, verse 1. I, therefore, prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in the manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. Chapter 4, verse 17. Now this I say, testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the fertility of your minds. That's the one has walked down twice. Chapter 5, verse 2. Our memory work for today, for this month. And walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice to God. Chapter 5, verse 8. For at one time you were darkness, and now you are light. Walk as children of light. And chapter 5, verse 15. Look carefully, then, how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise. Is there a correlation? I think so. He's concerned about how they walk. When he left, he said, you know, grievous wolves are coming in. Um, Ephesus, if you go to Revelation chapter 2, Christ has a great commendation for them. They did a lot of really, they were really strong. But he said, one thing against you, that you left your first love, that relationship with Christ, they had, and you need to get back there. Now, that was written in 95, and this that was in the 40s or 50s, when Paul was there. Um, what do we, our adversary, Satan, what do we, what's Satan doing? I have my, my question here. Um, first one, 
Imagine being in a battle, being shot by an unseen enemy. What thoughts would go through your mind? And in the quarterly, they asked for any veterans who were in war, and they had a discussion about teaching about their enemy and to share that. Any war stories? Okay. But that's, uh, what do we know about Satan? Satan is an author. S Satan is the author of sin. And I mentioned earlier that, you know, we were in, when we were in darkness, we were in the control of him. We stepped into the light. Away from but we have our flesh. Apostle Paul said, within my flesh there dwelleth no good thing. So, our battle, you can bring that slide up there, thank you. <clears throat> And the need for the armor is because we have this thing with the flesh. Now, Satan, we allow it, and we're going to read some scripture that he can pick up this vibration. He's the prince and the power of the air. The air is a medium that transmits, and I'm, I'm talking into this microphone, it turns it into radio waves and sends it back there, and then it comes back the sound waves through this medium of air. But if we allow it, we can pick up that vibration and we're, we're done. If we, if we yield to that. There's interesting, uh, we, just a couple things in, uh, in Luke 3, 13, 16, Christ mentioned that Satan had bound this woman for 18 years. We see in uh, Matthew 4, 1, he's the tempter. He tempted Christ. For Thessalonians 3, 5, the tempter incites us to sin. First Timothy 3, 7, and be careful of the snares of the devil. Maybe a little idea of where Satan went on, off the track might help us. I don't know. Um, we go to um, Ezekiel 28, I think it's about 15, that said there was a point where iniquity is found in his heart. Satan, Lucifer. In the, the Greek word for Satan or devil is maligner, a characteristic of what he's doing. Isaiah chapter 14, 12 through 14. Here again, I, uh, John Barnett shared this, and I took notes as he was talking, and then I went back with a concordance to look these words up just to make sure. Yeah. And I wrote down the, the uh, concordance number from Strong's. The uh, verse 12 of Isaiah 14. How you have fallen from heaven, O day star, Lucifer, O son of dawn. He was created in beauty to bring honor and glory. How you are cut down. You are laid low to the, laid the nations low. There's five I wills here. And this is where we're going to pick this up in 13. He said, I will ascend to heaven. The Hebrew word there is self-assertion, self-asserted himself. I will set my throne on high. Number two, self-promotion. I will sit on the mount of the assembly. Number three, self-centeredness. In the far reaches of the north, Verse 14, I will ascend above the heights. Self-exaltation. Above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. Number five, self-deception. Being self-deceived is the final result of walking away from God. 
blinding our own eyes. So just a little bit about Satan. I don't know that I thought it was interesting. We're going to go to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. <clears throat> I hesitate to read a lot from the concordance or from the identity of life in Christ. <clears throat> this is really, this nails it as far as this verse and the, the whole study today. It's about our armor. Be strong in the Lord. And Paul wrote, finally, brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Ephesians 6.10. In the original text, be strong is passive. It indicates we are made strong by a power outside of ourselves. We can't resist Satan without the Lord, the source of our strength. However, be strong is in the passive tense. It means we ought to be strengthened continually. The Lord provides his strength for daily battles, to ignore Paul's instructions, to be strong in the Lord would be devastating to us. And it is. The second question there, uh, what do you predict would happen to a believer who lives oblivious to Satan's desire to defeat him or her. This is one thing about, I'm, yeah, I see that hand down. Um, I was sick the last two weeks, and watching this on YouTube, this is the part I miss. You guys, go ahead, John. <laughs> Ephesians 5.11, take no part of the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. <clears throat> Second Timothy, oh, excuse me, 2 Corinthians 2.11, so that we would not be outwitted by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his designs. 2 Timothy 2.25, I mentioned this a few weeks ago, and here again, I was, this was, this whole lesson was on my mind, and this come up. Uh, Apostle Paul is talking to Timothy, and I, I kind of started out in the middle of correcting his opponents with gentleness, so evidently whoever's opposing Timothy, God may perhaps grant them repentance leading to the knowledge of the truth, and they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. This is when a person's given himself over and to Satan's desires. Can that happen? Well, we're, go ahead, John. Partying when they should be praying. And the enemy at the gate. In 
You know, this um, being snared by the devil, the Greek word for that is the concept of being taken in a prisoner of war to do Satan's bidding. Actually, as this lesson goes, the next question, um, and I'm going to read it. Question three, what do you learn about the devil by comparing him to a roaring lion? And I'm going to uh, be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour Remember, Peter's right in this. <laughs> I think how appropriate, because remember, Jesus said to Peter, get me behind, get behind me, Satan. He called him Satan. Well, that's not very nice, is it? And why was that? Because he was not falling in line to what, he said, no, you're not going to go to the cross. He was, he was off track with what Christ was going to do. Later, Christ talks to him and says, you know, Satan wishes to sift you like wheat. But I'm praying for you that when you're converted, that you will come back and strengthen the brothers. So he knew what this issue was, personally. Be sober-minded. Study on that. You know, isn't it nothing to do with alcohol, although don't. But it has to do with our thinking process and how we view spiritual things and God and our relationship to, uh, to Christ. Not to be flippant. Don't be flippant. A roaring lion. You're next, Roger. They, they're petrified, yeah. and they don't move. I was reading something about lions. It goes along with that, that when they roar, you could drop a pin in the jungle. It's like everything's where's he at? And it's an enormous, uh, I've never heard an African-Asian lion, but when I want to hear it, it, it hurts your ears. When I was a kid, I, uh, a neighbor had a uh, bloodhound, and he wanted me to feed him and water him while he's on vacation. Said, okay. So I went over there, and I remember the first time I went up to the pen, that dog barked, and it hurt my ears, because my ears are a whole lot better than they are now. And I never forgot that. How much was it a lion? Martha and I were reading through uh, Daniel, this thing of devouring Remember when the satraps met justice to the king? Daniel was delivered in the, in the story. Well, the king rounded up the family of the satraps and the satraps and put them in the same lion's den. And it says in the scripture that their, all their bones are broken before they hit the floor. That's a lot of power. A lot of power. Any? Question four. What of life's issues Paul covers in Ephesians 4 through 6 9? Seems to be Satan's favorite battlefronts. I didn't put any scripture to, down for that. Because <clears throat> this is kind of review. So let's go back. Help me if I miss any of these. Child-parent relationship, husband-wife, employer-employee. Those three, did I miss any? I don't think so. You know, why were the times we're going to fall down in those areas in our relationships to our spouse and our raising children? And, and they're the most sensitive to us. 
most emotional. And we all need a place to work, you know? And, and you know, I don't know if you've seen tensions and everybody trying to be somebody at work, and all the politics. It's a time to give God, God glory in our lives and follow him. It's interesting, uh, 6 9 Masters, do the same to them, and stop the threatening, knowing that he who is both your master and yours in heaven, and that there is no partiality with him. One of the attributes of God is that he is impartial. You know, I think in all these areas we mentioned, if we could emulate that partiality, in raising our kids and our wives, not accusing others of things that you're not even sure of. Impartiality. Any other thoughts on that? Fifth question five. How do the apostles respond to the devil's fury? Scriptures I had are uh, Acts uh, 5, 41, 42, 43, 42. They rejoiced. They counted all joy to suffer for the sake, for the name of Christ. In Acts 7, 59, uh, 60, this is the account of Stephen and stoned. Stephen deserved being stoned? No, he was there with a gospel message and he, the sermon he gave before they stoned him. But in 60, verse 60 there, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he, he fell asleep. Count it joy to suffer for the name of Christ. Question six. What are some truths that must be remembered in the battle? I'm going to intend it on reading the pick up at this point verse 11. Ephesians 6, 11. Now put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against rulers and against authorities and against cosmic powers over this present darkness against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done to all to stand firm, stand therefore having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and the shoes for your feet having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish any of the flaming darts of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation, sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, here you get sober minded now, making supplication for all the saints and also for me. The words that be given to me to, in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, 
that I may declare it boldly as I ought to. So what are the truths that we must remember going into the battle? We're going to talk, <clears throat> we talk about the bell truth, breastplate of righteousness, sandals of peace, shield of faith, helmet of salvation. What is truth in your life? Pilate said, what is truth? The, the reason he, had, he was confused, I believe, was that truth to him, see, the, the Greek philosophy had run a course. And the Epicureans, truth was what you felt. How much you ate, indulgements, you know, feeding the flesh. And setting Christ free did not come, you know. His truth was what he could feel. But did he have a full belly? Was he hanging over? You know, was he drunk? Was he, you know. But in our lives, truth. How very important that would be truthers. Breastplate of righteousness. I don't have any righteousness. Anybody hear any righteousness? We have Christ's righteousness, sandals of peace. The gospel brings peace. Shield of faith, helmet of salvation. Just okay. You mentioned uh, reference First John four four. Mm hmm. You know, and we remember that he, back when I was mentioned in his disillusionment, um, self, Satan is not self-existent. Only God is self-existent. He was a created being, and he'll have an end in the lake of fire. Yeah, along with that, John eight forty four. Jesus is talking to the uh, Pharisees. He says, you are your father, the devil, and your will is to do your father's desire. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. John 15, 5. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whosoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Try going on your own. Don't. Go ahead. No nope. protection for the back. No. Nope. And the greatest weapon that God gave us is prayer. It's it's the best weapon that we could ever have. And whenever we feel You're getting ahead of me, but go ahead. <laughs> tailing end of the Roman Empire, you know, wearing that breastplate and that helmet, lugging that shield around. Those shields, they could lock them together, and the emperor could ride over them with a chariot. I don't know who did that. 
and they'd lock them together and go as a, as a wall. And this sword mentioned here is a short sword that when you hold back, you can get, reach out with it. And what they found out was the barbarians would watch the legions and they would take this stuff off and they'd be soaking their feet in the creek, you know, and they said, this is the time to go in and take them. When they had all this armor off, it takes time to get that on. They had to wear it all the time. The belt had some really good, if you, if you were going to participate in a battle and you had your long cloak on, the belt's handy to tuck up your, gird up your loins. The breastplate protects the most vulnerable parts of your body. Sandals, these sandals, these shoes had steel plates in them, keep them sliding in the, the mud, and as they'd march, you, you know, this hobnail boot thing. The shield of faith. The shield shows darts on it. What they would do is they would fill the arrows with a flammable oil. Now, if you didn't have, if you were missing your shield, and that would hit your breastplate, you'd be covered in burning oil. You'd be in trouble. Helmet of salvation. The helmet. They did a, excavated a, a battle scene area and they'd go through these, you know, dig off the dirt. And they'd examine the skull and they noticed, we know how this person died. He's got a puncture wound through his skull or is cut by a battle axe. A lot of, a lot of injuries from that. Question seven. Have you ever had Satan tell you that you were a miserable failure? And how did you respond? Thank you. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, yeah. And just trying to take that. And old away. people. Um, just how important it is to tell our friends and loved ones yeah. and remind them of how much we value them and we care for them. Yeah. Because I, I don't think sometimes that the devil gets control of us and he gets that and he starts whispering in our ear and telling us how unvaluable we are. Um, I think of uh, Ben Sherbert. read earlier that we are his workmanship created unto Christ Jesus. Wow. You know, I think that's where I try to talk to my boys about I said, you know, you, you want to think you're something. You know, you want to promote yourself like, you know, like Satan. You want to Realize your value in Christ. Don't ever lose sight of your value as a child of the king. And what he's done for us. 2 Corinthians 5.16. I just love this 
and I've, I've come back here before. For now, therefore, we regard as no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Wow. The old has passed away, and behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. You want a ministry? Right there. No greater than that. This, that is Christ. That is, in Christ, God has reconciled the world to himself not counting their transgressions against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors of Christ. God, making his appeal through us, we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God for our sake. He made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that at, in him we might become the righteousness of God. Never forget that. Breastplate of righteousness. Question eight. What have you witnessed the gospel bringing peace to a new recruit. <clears throat> Don't ever leave. You know, my uh, high school job, I worked in this gas station for two years after school on Saturdays. And uh, during that period of time in my senior year in high school, there was um, a gentleman in, in our community. He worked with the local trash hauler. And he would jump out of the truck and go, the old days, they didn't have the hydraulics. He'd hoist that thing up and dump it. His name was Cliff. And you remember Cliff? Oh. And a family in the church that just lived down from him, the road from him invited him to come to church. And I remember that Sunday morning, the invitation was given, and Cliff ran down the aisle and fell on his knees. I guess you could say Cliff was the town drunk, and so his he would, his boss, and he would, on Friday night, they'd ride into town, and I never saw Cliff up till this point where he accepted Christ, because he would stay with his boss at the local tavern, and then his boss, they'd separate ways of them. Well, lo and behold, it was on a Friday night, and it's funny, my boss came in early. I said, well, and he saw Cliff come running down the street because he would, he'd come in there and he'd drink a couple new grapes. I don't know, remember those? He'd down a couple of them. And he had issues with all these years of alcohol. He'd come in and I'd talk to him and my boss would say, well, you know, Cliff needs a ride home. And he, he lived out of town about five miles up in the hills. There's a lot of state land off that way. And uh, one of the nights there, I was driving him home. It's funny, he would grab the door handle because I think it was part of his occupation. He had to get out to get the garbage and get back real quick. I don't know. But he said, he told me one night, he said, he pointed off to all this. He would cut across lots to get home. Instead of going down, he would just go across all the state land. 
And he said, you know, he said, I passed out out there, and it snowed and rained on me. And I, I'm not there again. I won't go there. Because he'd come to Christ, and he'd, he'd put all the alcohol away, and he had peace. Peace with God. So, that's my story. I'll never forget that. Yes. I heard somebody. Okay. Question. Question nine. How has the shield of faith, faith recently extinguished one of the fiery darts in your life? I'm going to read the scripture I got, if you don't. Um, Romans 10, 17. So faith cometh by hearing, and hearing through the word of Christ. Has God's word and helped you, your faith? See, without listening to God's word without being here, your, your faith in your life, can God really carry me through without looking at his promises? Go ahead. And that is, that whole psalm is about God's word and how it affects us, how it brings us along, how it leads us, how it keeps us on track. Thank you. Question 10. How might a church congregation, how might a church encourage its members to wear their helmet in battle? Helmet of salvation. Yeah. Good sound doctrine. Yeah. Discipleship program. Encouraging one another in, in prayer. What are you going to talk about? Praying for one another, too. Helmet of salvation. Do you ever doubt your salvation? Yeah. And then here again, staying in the word will reinforce that. Question 11. What verses... Okay, I'm sorry. Wonderful series. Yeah. 
Anything else? What verses have you memorized in preparation for Satan's attack? Oh, yeah. That's our sins. He is faithful. He is faithful. Um, I got 1 Corinthians 10, 13. I got to memorize it in the ESV, but here is the ESV. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful. Oh, there's that word again. God is faithful and will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but with the temptation, he will also provide a way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Wow. Time and time again, I can tell you stories where this, this is, yeah. Yep. Amen. Amen. He that hath the Son hath life. Hmm. Describe the openness. This is question 12. Describe the openness Paul used. And requesting prayer for himself. This, um, I thought this was really, and this is really combined with question 13. He's asking the Ephesians. Some interesting things here in, nine, in, in chapter 6, verse 19 and 20. And also for me, that the words may be given to me and open my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chain, that I might declare it boldly as I ought to speak. Here's the greatest pastor, missionary, And he is open, and he's asking the Ephesians to pray for him. Because before this, he talks about praying, making supplication for all the saints. He's including himself. I sure appreciate it. And I've mentioned this before. Apostle Paul is very open. He says, oh, wretched man that I am in Romans. Um, he has truth. He understands who he, what he is and where he is at any one time, and he that lays it open. If we don't share this, our problems, and this one right here is where I, I fall down. I said that I might be bold in preaching the gospel. We need that. We probably have a prayer request every Wednesday night. Please pray that I might be bold. I might be bold in my neighbor that's dying of cancer. It's not easy. He had a problem with it. He shared that. His openness. I'd love to get just a part of that in my life. I'm not, yeah. How might refusing to share our fears and struggles help the enemy gain in this battle against us? We are. We're all alone, and we have all of you to pray, and we have God, the Holy Spirit, and we don't ask. You ask not, and you have not. So, any parting thoughts on this? You mean an accountability partner? Yeah. 
Yeah. But sometimes you need somebody to put their arm around you yep. and support you. That's a good point. Does everybody here have one? Somebody that you can share and they, you won't hear about it a week later from somebody else, you know? But let's close in prayer. Lord, we, we bow before this, uh, you, and we understand that uh, in so many ways and so many times uh, you have protected us and you've guarded us. We just pray for our, our lives and the uh, days going forward. We pray for our accountability and prayer for others. We just thank you for this time and delving into your word. We just love you and we understand that you have everything for us and the best in mind. Now that be with the service that follows and just use your word in our hearts. In your precious name. Thank you.